your open source advocate and I'm back with another video and this week I wanted to cover a pretty cool little application that I came across called dBeaver. It is dBeaver community is the open source version. They do have an enterprise edition so if you're looking for something that someone else can help you out with and give you support on and has a few extra features uh, beyond what I show you in the community edition you might want to consider the enterprise edition. It looks pretty reasonably priced and like a pretty nice uh, piece of software with some good additions to it as well. So dBeaver, uh, last time I did a, a database piece of software that was open source is uh, MySQL Workbench, which is an amazing piece of open source software. If you, if you strictly and only use MySQL or MariaDB, I highly recommend you go check out that video. And I'll put a link in the description in the show notes to it so you can kind of check it out for yourself. But if you're looking for something that offers not only MySQL or MariaDB, but maybe PostgreSQL or SQL Server, um, you know, several other different database types, and in fact, a lot of different other database types, then dBeaver might be the one that you're actually looking for. It's got some pretty nice features here, and you can kind of see as it scrolls through, it's got kind of a night mode. You can do ERDs with it, which is kind of an important thing a lot of times. You know, in my job, a lot of times as a product owner, um, I'm trying to come up with an ERD and an, an entity relationship diagram for the way that our database is laid out. Uh, because you can provide that to other vendors and, and they can start creating, um, you know, they can start creating add-on products for your, for your system. You can let them know what's going on as far as an API is concerned in the background, how that's working in the database. And, and that, of course, all depends on if you're kind of trying to keep database stuff pri you know, proprietary or anything like that. But I think the ERD tool is kind of a cool feature. And, and really getting it set up is, is not super complex. So there's really two modes that I want to go through on this with you. Um, first is going to be basically just downloading the installable desktop application, which is great. I like it. It's got Windows, it's got Mac OS X, and it's got Linux capabilities for you to install it on. So that makes it a really, really great tool just for using across different platforms, depending on what you're working on at the time. But they also have a hosted version called, let's see, yeah, called Cloud Beaver. So this one is pretty cool. I'm going to click on it here. It's going to take us up to GitHub, and I've actually got it open up here in the other tab, so we can go back here on this one and just stay on that screen. But I'm going to go over here to GitHub. Um, so this thing's really cool. It's got a Docker-capable installation, and then you basically connect to it through the web browser. And you use the web browser to do your queries, and again, you can connect to all kinds of different databases and things. Um, it's pretty nice, so I, I will go through this with you guys as well as how to, you know, on how to install that with Docker and get it set up on a server. Uh, a little bit of stuff involved in it, but they have a nice little script that makes it pretty easy. I do make a few modifications, kind of like I always do, because there's a few things that they set as default that you may or may not want, and it's just important for you to know what those things are. Before I continue on with the video, I just wanted to say thank you so much to my patrons over at Patreon. I truly appreciate the support that you're giving me. It just really means so much to me, and, and I can't say thank you enough, but, but truly, from the bottom of my heart, thank you very much. Also, thank you to all the subscribers on YouTube and everybody who watches these videos. I really appreciate it. And if you'll take just a second to click the thumbs up if you like this video, um, you know, subscribe, you know, click for notifications if you want to be notified about new videos that come out. Uh, I really appreciate that as well. It means a lot to me. And, and just I cannot say thank you enough to everybody who's been supporting me and doing this. I'm enjoying it. I'm having a great time. And I hope you're learning something from me as I go along. So thank you very much. Now let's get started with this install. So first, let's talk about the actual desktop application. So I'm going to click on download here. So they've got a couple of different options here for installing in Linux. So you can see they have a Deb if you're running a Debian based system. They have uh, RPM packages if you're running something that's Red Hat based that they can run RPM packages. They've just got the plain old Linux 64 bit that's in a zip file. You might have to do some make for that. But if you have a system that supports Snap, you can use Snap to install this. Or if you prefer Flatpak, then they've also got Flatpak installers. So they've got a lot of different ways you can install this on Linux. And then, of course, it does support Windows and Mac OS X as well. So I'm going to grab the Snap command here since I'm running a Ubuntu-based system here. I'm going to copy it. I'm going to open up my terminal. And this should be big enough text for you guys. Let me I'll make it a little bit bigger just to be sure. And then I'm just going to paste this command in, and I'm going to hit enter, and it's going to prompt me for my sudo password, and we'll let this thing install real quick. And it's done. That took probably about 10, 15 seconds. It really wasn't that long. Um, just, just didn't take long to get that installed. So I'm going to get that out of the way. I'm going to go over here to my menu, and I'm going to type in db, and it's dbver community right there. So we're going to open that up now. 
It'll give you a splash screen, and depending on your hardware, it may take a little longer, or you know, just depending, because it's going to open up a Java application, and I guess the JRE is installed with the Snap. It's not running a JRE on your system, so it takes just a second, especially the first time, to kind of get it opened up and ready. So the first thing it's going to do is going to pop up, and it's going to ask you, create a sample database, and you can say yes or no. In this case, I don't want a sample database. I've actually got a database engine that I'm going to connect to remotely. Um, so I'm going to say no, but you can do that if you want to create one. And then it kind of comes up with this get started wizard here. And it shows you the different options that you just have out of the box for, for picking a database you want to connect to. Um, and it tells you kind of what's going on. So it, it kind of gives you popular, but there is all, which adds a few other options here. And I hate to say a few, uh, quite a lot of other options here that you can try to connect with um, and, you know, and connect to which is pretty great. I mean, this, this is a lot of different database types. Um, so I'm going to go back to projects, but it starts here, but you can kind of go through and pick, and then you can see it breaks it down into SQL. Now, I don't think there's any NoSQL, un unfortunately, which kind of is a bummer to me. Um, you know, MongoDB would be a great one to have, but I think you only get that with Enterprise. So if you're looking for MongoDB support, there's other tools out there for MongoDB. And if you're interested in that, let me know in the comments, and, and I will be glad to do a couple of uh, MongoDB options as well. Um, but but yeah, no is not there. Um, analytical databases. So if you're looking for for analytics, um, you know just you can see all of the different options that are here. And, and really, when you click all, you just see everything that comes up. But there, there's there's quite a bit of stuff here that is supported. I think uh, maybe unfortunately they see the benefit of uh, no SQL, and everybody wants to see no SQL data these days. I, I don't know. Uh, maybe it's just harder to write for, so they want that to be an enterprise uh, type feature. But in this case, I'm going to go back to uh, popular, and we're going to do MariaDB. Um, so once you kind of select MariaDB, um, oh, you can also filter just by typing in uh, right here. And you see, just as quick as I can type, it comes up with MariaDB. So I'm going to click on that. It's going to go to the next page here, and it's going to ask me where it's at. So in this case, I'm going to put in 192.168.7.125. That's where my MariaDB is hosted. Uh, you can specify a database if you want to connect to a specific database by database name here, but I'm not going to do that because I want to be able to access all of them from this. You need to put in your username for this uh, particular uh, database that you're going to connect with. Um, root is a bad idea with MariaDB, so hopefully you're not doing that, but if you are, you can leave it as root. Uh, but you, you really should create a user um, and, and a password, a strong password for that user that's not root. Uh, and then put in your password for that database um, and then you can kind of say save password locally so it doesn't prompt you every single time you connect server time zone it has auto detect but if you need to set this you can um, so it's kind of up to you but I am not in Africa I'm in America so um, I would go and find America Chicago which should be right here and I can set that and then it kind of gives you what the uh, the local um, client is going to be doing and then there's a little bit more information down here if you want to see any more for any, any other kind of stuff. Um, so the driver name is MariaDB. I'm just going to leave that, and then I don't want to edit the driver settings. I'm going to click on Finish, and you'll kind of see what, what comes up next. There are other, um, you can click on Driver Properties if you want to see this. Now, it's when you click Finish or when you click on these other tabs, it's going to tell you, hey, you picked a driver that's not installed yet, um, and it's going to ask you to go ahead and just download that driver. So you just click on the Download button right here. And it's going to go get it, and it's going to do its thing, and it's going to put it in place. So now you can see the driver properties. Um, if you need to do SSH in order to get uh, installed and get connected to the actual system, you can set it up here. If you have a proxy, same thing, and then SSL if you're going to do that. So I'm just going to leave it with the settings that I've already got. I'm going to click on Finish, and it's going to go over here and connect. So I'm going to bring this down so you guys can kind of see it better. Now, I don't think I can make this interface much bigger, unfortunately. Uh, but I can probably zoom in in post-editing, so I will try to remember to do that so that you can see this in, in kind of more in the full screen view. Um, I can make it full screen, but then I'm zooming into part of the window. So I'm going to leave it like this for now. So here you can see my connection, which, which it says, you know, is, is 125. So if I click on the little expansion arrow, you see that it goes and it asks for the information. It went and got my databases, and you can see my different databases that are being hosted there right now. And I'm just going to click on this eBay data database. And then I'll click on tables, and I've only got one table in there, but you can actually click and see the columns now. So there, there's really this thing is really a great, um, nice system for, for looking at MySQL or, or, or any kind of SQL databases. Um, 
it's got quite a bit of capability here. So one of the things that I like to do is I like to right click, especially in uh, like MySQL Workbench and, and tell it to you know go grab my first X number of, of results. This doesn't appear right now to, to kind of have that type of function. And I don't know why, but there is like a view data. So when I click on view data, nothing happens though. And I kept kind of wondering like, why is that not showing me anything? But I think if I double click, then it goes and it says, hey, we can find out some information about this database. And then right here, you see it says data. And then up here, you can see the ER diagram. Of course, this is just one table. There, there is nothing else to diagram out, but I think that's a pretty cool feature. I'm going to go back to properties. So you can see the database properties. And you can see the column schema, and you can kind of check out what that looks like and what those different uh, types are in those columns, which is, which is super handy whenever you're trying to do DBA, DBA, database administration. And then I'm going to switch over to data. Uh, yeah, so I've got some data here. <clears throat> and you can see that I take my dates and I break those down into the year and then into the actual day of the week and the month of the year because I do some statistics on that. This is not how I get the data from eBay. I run scripts whenever I get this data in. But here you can see a view of the data that, that's going on. And then over here on the right, you, you've got some different information about value, um, you know, things like that. So as you keep looking at this, there's a lot of tools around the edge that it's really important for you to kind of take note of. Um, so there's save, cancel, script, and then down here you've got edit uh, cell value. So you can actually edit the cell values in a separate window. So, so there's a lot of little features here that I, I think it's you know, important for you to notice and kind of check out because there's some really great features here. And then you can kind of move through the data, you know, the same way. And then, you know, fetch the next page. So if you're limiting your results, so this one has 200 rows fetched. I know I have a lot more than 200 rows. Um, so if I click here, I think I can change this. Um, so it's telling me 200 rows fetched. Um, I actually want to change how many rows it's getting. So initially it's only going to pull 200 rows because that's what it defaults to. But if you want more than that, so I know I have more than 200 rows, you can just click into this box here at the bottom left and then add to it as you as you see fit and now I can click refresh right here which should rerun my query so I'm going to click on the refresh here so that I can see that it, so it's getting the count of the rows and then I'm going to go ahead and click on F5 and that should refresh my data and now you can see it did I've got 1435 rows Now up here in the top, if you're not a SQL guru, the kind of nice thing about this is you can say, oh, you know, I really love to see like how many of these things are just from 2020. So you can type year and you see it starts giving you a helper here. And you can click on that and then equals 2020. And I'm going to go ahead and hit this little go button, this little play button here, which is apply the filter. And if you look, I only get 2020 here in my year column, and it's dropped it down to 1,112 rows instead of the full 1,400 whatever it was. So you can see that for 2020, I've got a little bit more. Now, if, I'm, if I say, okay, that's interesting, now 2019, I can just switch that out and again hit the play button, and it gives me a count of how many rows I've got for 2019, and I can, I can start filtering my data really simply right here without really knowing any SQL. I'm just kind of putting in a simple filter right here. Now they have some other tools where you can set up filters and you can save those filter settings and things like that. So again, very worth looking at and checking out these different uh, features here. So this part where it says value, I'm just going to I'm just going to close that because it gives you a few more rows to look at for one thing. So if I said, you know what, uh, sale month name is interesting, but I want to know about sale day name. So I'm going to say sale day and you see it fills in automatically. I can just uh, I can just uh, hit enter, I think, and it'll take it. Yes, equals. And I'm going to say, let's just see what I do on Tuesday. And I may need quotes around this. We're going to find out if it if it hates it. Yeah. So I need quotes around Tuesday because it's a string. There we go. So I type in uh, sale day name, and that's the name of the field here at the top of the column. And then I tell it I just want to see what I have for Tuesday. And here you can see I've got 171. So 171 sales are out of are off of Tuesday. So you, you start seeing you can do some things with queries and start breaking things down to start doing some statistics and things like that. But I'm not having to really write SQL in order to get this. I'm just 
putting in some filters that I want to use. So I think this is a really great, great system. Uh, tons and tons of features. And, and really when you look at the SQL editor, so you've got a SQL editor as well. So you can go in here and I could actually write select star from eBay uh, data. Yes, dot eBay info, which is the, the, the uh, eBay data is the database. eBay info is the, the, the table. And I can say where sale and we'll say month name. So it gives you this nice uh, IntelliSense autofill, which is great equals let's just say October and then I'll put a semicolon right here after it so when I click on that play button you can see that I get my results out here and it's got October only listed if we scroll we're not we shouldn't see any other month name listed here it's just gonna be October and we can see that we've got 186 rows now that's gonna be out of two different years which is fine but I'm starting to fill I'm starting to fill this down and I can actually write full SQL queries here as well if I want to so this is a really nice program, it's called dBeaver, and, and I'll have links so you can go download this. And now I want to move to the part where I'm actually going to show you how to um, install the Docker side and use it from Docker, and we'll, we'll kind of go through that. So I think you're going to like that because it gives you a nice, easy way to get to it through a web browser. So if you've got multiple users, you can create multiple accounts and those users can go in and actually access just this web user interface to do some things in the database and you're not really having to install this application on every machine if you don't want to. Um, so I think it's pretty pretty cool to do uh, to, to take a look at that as well, and it's a nice offering that they've got. All right, now I want to talk about this uh, thing called Cloud Beaver, which is a, another offering from the dBeaver guys or dBeaver folks, and it's basically a, a web-based uh, hosted type setup for dBeaver. So it says here, it's a database manager, computing edition, and it's web server, which provides rich web interface. And the server itself is a job application, but the web part is written in TypeScript and React. So it's pretty modern. It's using a Java backend with a front end of React uh, and TypeScript. Um, I can make this a little bit larger for you guys. And you can see the interface here. It's, it's not bad looking. It's got some pretty cool features as well. So when it says run in Docker, we're going to click on the uh, running instructions here, and I'm just going to open that in a new tab, and it's going to take us over to uh, their wiki on their GitHub page. And they kind of give you the easy one here, which is, you know, that's fine, you can pull it, but uh, we actually want to run this thing here with this type of command. And we're going to go down and look, because there's a couple of important things for you to note. So this restart and let's stop, this is another option you can add to it, and then hyphen D to run it as a daemon, so they're kind of telling you, hey, you could add these things as well, and we want to do that. Um, so accessing databases on localhost. If you want to access a database on the same machine where you're running this Docker container for Cloud Beaver, and the database is actually running on the metal of the machine, then you need to set it up in a specific way. So one of those is to say dash dash network equals host, but that could create other issues uh, depending on on, on what else you need to access. Uh, the other thing they give you is kind of this layout, which is kind of a regular expression to get set up and everything. Um, and then they kind of give you this little script that you can run, and they point you to this script. So you can get this script out of the actual um, GitHub if you want to pull down the, the GitHub site. Uh, and I'll show you the script, and I have kind of modified it, and we'll modify it a little bit more here in a minute so that you can see it, and then I'll post it on the show notes and the description. But then they also tell you, here's the parameters that we're using. So they're giving it a name, which is Cloud Beaver. You can change this if you want. Um, and then RM. So this says, removes the container on stop. I, I don't want this because sometimes I stop my containers and then I'm going to restart them again. I don't want it to, to remove it just because I stopped it. I, I, I just I stop them sometimes. So I'm going to get rid of this part. Um, so terminal mode, this just enables terminal mode and allows you to stop the container with um, basically control C. Um, again, I don't, I don't want this right now, so uh, we'll probably take that out. The ports that they set, so they're saying 8080 points to 8978. Um, I think in their script they have 8978 pointed to 8978. It's just so you get 8080 for your, for your IP address when you type it in. Remember, left side is host, and then right side of the colon is container. So we'll, we'll change this to whatever we need to change it to in order to be able to access it. Uh, and then a volume, so they give you a volume that you're going to set up uh, to persist some data and then this part is kind of like add the host name of the containers etsy host file 
This is to help you be able to access database that may be on the localhost machine. And then basically this is just your container ID that you're pulling down. So this is the same stuff that I explained to you whenever I actually show you the Docker command. So let's get into the actual running of this thing. So I'm on my server and I've already got a folder made, but I'm going to show you what I did. So first thing out, just make a new folder, MKDIR, and call it whatever you want. If you want to call it dbeaver, call it that. Um, if you want to call it cloud beaver, call it that. That's fine. CD into your cloud beaver folder. And now you're going to do nano and you're going to make an install script. So just name it something that you can find. Docker install .sh is fine. It doesn't have to be anything special. Just name it something really easy for you to identify. All right, so I'm going to show you what you want to actually put into this script. And I'm just going to paste it in, but we'll go through it uh, line by line. So right here, you've got basically detect the host machine IP address. We need this whenever we run in Docker container. So then it says we're going to export a, a global variable here or, or an environment variable. And basically this is that uh, long looking, ugly kind of here. I'll make this even longer. Um, big thing where they're using regular expression to say, you know, if, if I ask for local host, it's actually this machine that this Docker container is running on. That's all this is saying. It's just really long thing to say it. After that, you get into the docker run hyphen D. Okay, docker run hyphen D. That's run it as a daemon. Dash dash name Cloud Beaver. You can change this name to whatever you want. It's easy to identify as Cloud Beaver, so I just left it as it is. And then I'm going to take out the, I, the TI part here, and I'm going to leave the backslashes. So these backslashes just tell it, hey, when I go to the next line, you know, don't, don't think that's a different line. It's still the same command. I'm just trying to make it a little bit easier to read. So then we've got this port identification. So I'm going to use port 8121. You can use any port that you want that is open on your machine. If 8080 is open, feel free to use it. If 8978 is open, feel free to use that. Do not change the right side. Don't change this side. Only change the left side of this particular parameter because the left side is your host machine. The right side is your container. Okay, don't, don't change the right side. Then it's going to say add host. So host.docker.internal. And all it's doing is saying, hey, I'm going to post, I'm going to, I'm going to, <laughs> I'm going to post, I'm going to point. Next it's going to say add host. So this little line just says, I'm going to point my Docker host uh, internally. And I'm going to let it be able to see the local host. So it's just grabbing this environment variable we just used. And it's setting it up so that this Docker container can see the host in case you have a database running on it, which I do. That's why I need this line. Next, it's going to set up a volume. So slash var slash cloud beaver slash workspace. And that's going to point to, so that's on my host, is going to point to the container at slash opt slash cloud beaver slash workspace. This is perfectly fine. All good. And then this last line just says dbeaver dash or dbeaver slash cloud server colon dev. And this is the one that it's actually pulling from for us to use. So this is the development version. If you don't want the dev version, you need to put an actual version on here um, so that it doesn't get, uh, get the latest development version because that could be unstable. Um, and I think they say there's a couple of options here for the versions that you grab. Um, yeah, so they have latest if you prefer to use latest. And in fact, we'll use latest. How about that? Um, that's probably better than dev. So we'll get latest here. Okay, so we'll change that. And then the next thing is the other parameter that they mentioned, which is the restart. So we're just going to go up here. And I'm going to go to where this little backslash is. I'm going to move over one space. I'm going to hit enter. I'm going to hit four spaces and I'm going to say restart. And then we'll just make sure we type this correctly. And I think it was right above this. Yes, right here. So restart, and then we're just going to put unless stopped. And then we'll put another backslash so it knows to continue to the next line. So we're just going to add this line right here. And I'm going to put this, again, in the show notes in the description so you'll have it. But everything should be set. Um, we're going to make sure we have one line there at the end. I'm going to hit Control-O, and then hit Enter to save, and then Control-X. So now I've got this set up, and I'm ready to kind of run it. So I'm going to do chmod plus x, and I'm going to just run that against this shell script that I created. So I'm just going to hit enter, which means 
make this script executable so I can run it. That's all that means. And then to run it, I'm going to do dot slash docker hyphen install dot sh. Make sure you spell it correctly. If you want to use the tab completion in bash, you can just hit tab as long as it's the only thing in there with those letters that you've already typed. It'll just complete that out and we'll clear this out so you can read it easier. And we'll say dot slash docker install dot sh. It's going to pull down the latest. And there we go. Everything looks like it should be running. Now we can check this by going to Portainer on that server, which I happen to have running. And I can go in local and I can click on this and I see 14, which means I should have Cloud Beaver and it's running. So everything looks like it's running okay. Next thing we can do is just try it out. So I'm going to go to the IP address and then I set 8121. If you didn't change the port, it may be different, so make sure you know what port it's on. So I'm going to go there and check it. And it's coming up. So it comes up with this nice little kind of startup introduction, uh, which is great. So it says, Welcome to Cloud Beaver, Cloud Database Management Content. Um, it says the Easy Configuration Wizard will guide you through several simple steps to set up Cloud Beaver Server, which is great. So we're going to hit Next. And it's going to say, you know, hey, you can configure uh, several things here. So your main server parameters here. So you can give the server name any name you want. Uh, Cloud Beaver is fine uh, if, for me. If you're going to have a lot of these, you might want to name it something a little bit easier to tell what it is. Uh, there's a few things we want to set. So in this case, my uh, username is, is, I don't want it to be that. So I'm going to make it my name. And I think it has to be actually six characters. So I'll make it my longer version and then put in a password that you want to use as the admin so make it a strong password so that people can't guess it and get to your stuff and then over here on the right you've got a little bit of configuration as well so you notice you can't unclick this uh, if you don't want to allow anonymous access so you need to first enable user authentication then you can disallow anonymous access if you want to so if you're going to have multiple users you'd want to do this and then enable custom connections uh, i mean yeah, you can let your users do this, or you can be the administrator who has to set it up for them. It's, it's kind of up to you again. So if you turn it off, the users cannot set up their own connections. You'll have to set it up, and then they can access them. Uh, if you turn it on, the users can set up their own connections um, to databases and things like that they want to access. So if you're going to have, again, multiple users, you, you kind of want to think about how you want to set this up. Um, I'll just leave it on for you guys for now. I'm going to hit Next. So once it goes through that, it's gonna, uh, the, the browser is going to bother you about saving things. But now it's already looked and it sees localhost, which is kind of awesome. I, I like that it kind of spotted this on its own and it's like, hey, there's a database here. You know, it, it just tells me about it. It didn't say, uh, you know, do you really want to, you know, find any, any other ones? Now, I don't know if I do this, 192.168.7. Zero twenty-four. I don't know if it can actually search this way. Um, I'd be amazed if it could. Um, no, it, it doesn't seem to. Now, uh, if you check out the documentation, they may tell you no, it, it can. So, uh, in this case, I've got localhost, so I'm going to click on that because I need to put in some some data in order to connect to it. It says it's MySQL. That's fine. Um, so. You can create a template out of this if you want to. Uh, I can give it a description, so I'm going to call it Metabase Data. And then it's already got the information here. And again, if you want to connect to a specific database, you can. Uh, I don't in this case again. But there, this time it wants the database username. So my database username and my database password. And then you can tell it, remember the password, so you don't have to type that in every time if you want to. Uh, you shouldn't mess with the port, I think, unless you've changed the port intentionally, you shouldn't mess with the port. Uh, just, just be careful with that. And then it has some other things here, Postgres SQL, you know, SQLite, um, things like that. So I'm not, I'm not looking to do those things, uh, but uh, right now, so first you can test your connection. Um, I can tell you now that it's, gonna, it's probably going to give me a problem about the time zone. Let's find out, though. Yeah, so it failed. So when you get this, don't don't fret. Just look at the details. And there's a little bit of information here for you. So it says, the server time zone value, CDT, is unrecognized. So central daylight time, it doesn't understand what that is. So we need to fix the, the time zone. Now there's more information here if you need it. But 
just know that, that you can fix this if you need to. You can copy it to paste. Uh, if you get another error, some other kind of error, and you don't know, you can copy it and paste it into a, a blog post with uh, these guys from, from dBeaver and see if they can help you figure it out. But I'm going to close it because I know I need to set the, uh, the time. So I'm going to close this. I'm going to say I want to see um, driver properties, I believe, is where we want to go. Yeah, so it's got all these things that are that are part of the driver. Now it told me it's the the time zone, but it said server time zone. So I know I want to look for that. And if you look, this is in alphabetical order. Um, I don't really see a way to filter this thing. So um, probably just better to kind of scroll down. And I'm going to look for server or time zone. I'm kind of getting down here. I may have passed it. Let's see. Server time zone is right here. So it doesn't like what I have. So I'm going to put in America slash Chicago. And then I'm just going to click away from that. And it looks like it's set. I'm going to test the connection again. And this time it says connection has succeeded, which is awesome. Um, so I'm going to tell it, okay, great. Now let's create this guy and it's done so it says I've connected to it and here you can see that I'm connected to my local system okay um, so yeah so if we look oh and now we can click on next and I'm gonna say I don't need to do that and it says this is almost it and it gives you a little bit more information but it says you know press the finish button to complete the server configuration a little bit more stuff you guys can read when you're ready we're going to click on finish here, and now it wants me to log in because I said I want it to enable authentication and don't allow anonymous logins. So I'm going to put in my credentials that I used for my admin user for this software, not for the actual database itself. I'm going to hit log in, and I'm logged in. And up here you can see they've got this SQLite DB that, that we can check out if we want to, but I'm not going to do that. I'm going to open this one up, and I'm going to expand it. And again, you see you get this nice tree, so I have databases. And then I've got my eBay data, and then I've got my tables, and I've got my eBay info table right here, uh, which is which is great. This is some cool information now. I can open it, I can export it, I can refresh it. So I'm going to open it. So it opens up, and I, I keep moving this intentionally um, to give you guys a view of the same data that we're kind of messing with. But right here, so again, it's got this nice little filter. So I can say, you know what, I want to do sale day name. Now, it doesn't give you the pre-typing or the, the IntelliSense type typing, but still, if I say that equals, you know, quote, Tuesday, and then I can go down here and I just hit the little check mark. You can see it. It gives me all of the Tuesdays, and then down here it tells me 171 found. Um, if I go take this back out, I can just hit check, or I think you could have just hit the X to get rid of all those values. But here you see it says 200. So again, it's limiting to 200, but I can just click here at the bottom left and I can click and I can add a zero. So when I tab out, you can see it automatically refreshes itself and now it's got 1,435 rows of data and I can see that I've got uh, all of this data here. So if I wasn't sure that that was all of it for Tuesday a while ago, I can just check a different one. I can say uh, sale day name equals, let's try Thursday and again I can just check the little box or check click the check mark and I can see all of Thursday and it gives me 211 rows which is more than 200 so I know that it's actually functioning like I expect and now I think you can just click the little X there you go yeah we click the X and it all goes away and it refreshes and we're back to our 1435 rows so there's quite a bit of stuff that you can do here that's kind of cool now we've got properties so again you can see the properties of this of this table you can see the columns so it's going to load this up and you can see again the, the column properties for these different columns um, so you can kind of see the information here you can add columns delete columns you can you can do quite a bit of stuff from this um, and then you can go back to the data view so up here they've got tools so you've got a log viewer um, here you've got connections so you can do connections from a template a new connection you can disconnect from the database so another cool thing that I kind of like about this is they have this sorting capability. So if you click on the top uh, of the actual row and you click on these little buttons, you can say sort and it sorts. So you can see now that I've got Friday uh, as, my, as my first option. Um, I can click the other way and you see I've got Wednesday as my option. 
Um, so that's kind of cool. I like that and that it has that kind of built-in sorting. That's really awesome. Uh, and then we've seen the filtering capabilities here. Um, so there's some really cool features here that I think are, are just automatically built in that lets somebody come in and do some do some really great things with this data. So as the administrator, when you're looking, you've got these settings over here, and you can go into administration. So here you can see the connection name. You can see users. So if you have more than one user, you can see those users, and you can do an administration tasks on those users, adding users, deleting users, refreshing your list. And then server configuration. So if you need to change something about the configuration that you set up, you can come here and do that as well. Uh, if you click on the gear for other things, you can see themes. So there's light, and then there's dark. Uh, language, so it looks like you can change the language to other languages, and they've got quite a bit of stuff here that you can choose. And then, of course, log out if you want to log out. So this is a really cool offering for a web-based uh, application, and you can do some pretty great stuff with it. Uh, I haven't shown you every feature of it by any stretch, but I wanted to show you how to get it installed and how to get it running so that you could get in there and actually try it yourself. So Cloud Beaver and DBeaver, some really great tools that are open source, really make it easy for you to get in and play with your SQL data and, and just do some things with, with all kinds of different databases. So for those of you who are looking for Postgres tools, this is a really cool tool. Uh, if you're a MySQL person, it's, it's an awesome tool. If you're, if you're using other types of databases, you saw the whole list of databases there. I think it's definitely worth you going out and getting a download and taking a look at it. If you enjoyed this video, like, subscribe, click the little notification bell, and tell your friends about it so they can come along on the journey with us. And I'll talk to you next time.